The film you're going to see is one of the earliest films of Reg Redden's talking about action learning. The International Management Centres Association, as it's called now, developed out of an organisation called the Institute of Scientific Business, which was founded by a group of academics under the leadership of Dr Gordon Wills. Gordon and his colleagues were very impressed with Reg Redden's ideas, and launching their business school in 1982, they decided that all the programmes that they offered would be action learning programmes, which meant that the programmes would focus on business issues and challenges, the challenges that managers face every day as the vehicles for learning. Managers would learn in and from the workplace rather than in an academic institution. However, we had a problem. Potential clients and managers couldn't understand action learning. So the film you're about to see was produced to show them what action learning was all about. But not being a filmmaker, I made it in true action learning fashion on the job in 1984. The film is technically rather grainy, which is the video quality of the time. However, in action learning terms, we see Reg really developing his ideas, talking about his thoughts in his own words. He went on developing his thinking, and he knew that others would do the same. And now, in the 21st century, there is a plethora of uh, meanings of action learning. It means different things to different people. But it all started with the ideas that you will see Reg explaining very clearly. Reg became the first president of IMCA in 1982 and remained president emeritus until his death in 2003. Revan's university was established in his memory. Now, many years later, we have so much to thank him for. The manager's main job is troubleshooting, and what better way is there of developing him than setting him the task of unravelling real-life problems? In the 1940s, Professor Reg Revens started to develop this idea into a training method which he called action learning. We shall explore the idea with Reg Revens himself. Reg Revens describes his own career as stimulating. That's probably an understatement. There are few people, particularly in the field of management education, who can claim to have studied with 11 Nobel Prize winners at the Cavendish Laboratory and been a student of Einstein in Berlin. Reg Revens was born in 1907, and he then embarked upon a scientific career in atomic physics, first at University College London, where he obtained a prize-winning first, and then at Emmanuel College in Cambridge, where he received his PhD. In 1935, he changed the direction of his career, and was appointed Deputy Chief Education Officer for Essex, and then again in 1945 to become Director of Education at the National Coal Board. One might be forgiven for thinking that Reg Revens is essentially an academic man, but this is far from true. He is a man of action in every sense of that word. A member of the 1928 British Olympic team, he also held the University of Cambridge long jump record from 1929 until 1962. While at the National Coal Board, Professor Revens first proposed a programme of action learning as an effective method of problem solving. Although an expert himself in management, he believed that colliery managers could learn more by talking through their problems amongst themselves and personally taking actions rather than passively listening to management experts talking. Professor Revan spent the rest of his career developing his ideas of action learning, working within industry and the university system, both in this country, the United Kingdom, and overseas. His ideas have not always uh, appealed to the established world of management education, but industry and commerce have always taken a more positive attitude. Many companies, including GEC, Cable and Wireless, Courage and Unilever, have used his techniques most successfully. Action learning is an effective management training method and in 1982 we invited Professor Revens to become the first president of the International Management Centre from Buckingham, an entirely new business school based entirely again on the principles of action learning. As the acknowledged father figure of action learning, I asked Professor Revens to describe and talk about action learning in his own words. Reg, where did you get the idea of action learning from? 
the ideas themselves came from uh, a long number of years I spent as a research fellow studying problems in physics at the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge, where we discovered that the most fertile way of giving people fresh inspiration was to discuss not their achievements, but their difficulties. We actually developed ways of discussing each other's shortcomings. And 15 years later, when I became Director of Education to the Coal Board, I thought this might be a very good way of developing colliery managers. Let's get them together in small sets of five or six to try and talk to each other about their problems at depth, not just exchanging a few opinions over the bar in a pub, but actually meeting each other in, on each, in each other's minds to discuss their here and now problems. And all the time, the emphasis was not upon the marvelous things which people had done previously in their careers, but the uncertainties that they were facing at the moment, because this is exactly what I learned at Cambridge as a research fellow. Action learning is becoming a popular phrase, and uh, people use the phrase very loosely. As the originator of the idea, Reg, what's your definition of action learning? How would you describe the method? The applications of action learning are so universal that it's, you cannot describe one single method. But the central idea is that people who are in real trouble can help each other. A chap called Leonard Cheshire, who was a wartime pilot and for whom the nation subscribed a lot of money, said in founding the Cheshire Homes, the best way to deal with your own troubles is to go to somebody else's help. And action learning forms sets of comrades in adversity, people who recognize that they have really difficult problems. And action learning encourages these people to work together on their own, and mainly on their own, but also on each other's problems, meeting regularly to discuss what it is they think they're trying to do, what is stopping them from doing it, and what they can do about it. And providing there are not experts there with prefabricated solutions, which might have been perfectly valid in some other conditions altogether, then these comrades in adversity, since they all believe that what they need is real help, will very soon help each other. So it's a set of comrades in adversity, which is the foundation of action learning. Management education uses a variety of different techniques, all of which have been successful at one time or another, Reg, but almost all the methods rely on expert professional inputs to achieve effectiveness. Why do we need yet one more method of management training? What's particularly different about action learning from any other method we could uh, tackle it with? Surely it still involves learning from experts. Yes, of course, there can be no learning without the inspiration of somebody who can who impresses you and from whom you're going to learn. But the fundamental difference is this, that in a changing world, it is extremely important that people should be masters of the art of posing questions. When nobody knows what's going to happen next, you must have the skill to ask questions which are likely to get you somewhere. So all training, all development, contains two elements. First, getting new knowledge, which already exists, but you were not aware of, something that you would get hold of in a, a new lecture, by a new advisor, by reading a new book, by going to a new program. Of course, you must acquire fresh, what I call programmed information, P. But the need of us all today is not so much to get more expert knowledge, it is to get a very much more penetrating ability to ask questions of the unknown in which we are all now plunged. And the fundamental difference is that the learning in action learning is a small amount of P, program knowledge, and a large amount of Q, the ability to ask penetrating questions. So it's, it's the difference of the balance between what you are being instructed to do by experts, and what you are finding out you need to do for yourself. Reg, uh, would you develop the idea of P and Q for us? Yes, we live in a world which is changing very, very quickly. I don't know the world of every one of my listeners, but I can assure you that you'll find some aspect of it which has changed in your lifetime out of all recognition. 
Let us imagine this measures time, whatever you care to measure, such as the cost of posting a letter, the price of a pint of beer, the speed, maximum speed of human travel, the speed with which you can handle information in a computer. It is going up extremely quickly, changing the whole world with it. And all of us are trying to survive somewhere in that world of change at this time here, T. And how do we deal with change? We deal with change by learning. We have to handle things tomorrow which we knew nothing of yesterday, and so forth. So we have to learn. And you say, well, learning, we all know about. You go to school to learn. Somebody teaches you something. But a moment's reflection will tell you that what it is you're being taught in the school is something that was known yesterday, probably printed in a book. Might have been known 2,000 years ago. And you cannot deal with a rapidly changing world merely by knowing what is programmed from the past. You must also develop a capacity for asking intelligent and useful questions. So that learning consists in acquiring program knowledge, of course, but relevant program knowledge, relevant to your state of affairs, plus the general ability to ask questions when nobody around you knows what to do. And this is the field of traditional instruction, and this is the field of action learning. They are not, of course, separate. They, are, they merge with each other, but this is the important point. A knowledge of P may be necessary, but on the face of the precipice, it is not sufficient. You also need an ability to ask quite fresh questions when you don't know what to do next. Action learning could be just one more flavour of the month, Reg. I mean, can you give us some examples of action learning in practice? It has, in fact, been applied all over the world, and some of the most interesting applications are as far away as the city of Melbourne. But in a more general sense, what we're trying to do is to interest real managers in tackling real problems in real conditions. And there are several ways you can do this. For example, you can take real problems this way and real conditions this way and you can take real managers and push them in there. Now what type of problems have we got? What type of conditions have we got for a manager? Now the problem may be familiar to him or it can be unfamiliar. The conditions may be familiar or they may be unfamiliar. And what one is doing is putting a manager into any one of these four boxes to say, how does he respond there? And how does he see his response in such a way that he can discuss it with his colleagues in a set? Now let's begin in a very simple fashion. Familiar problems in familiar settings. The unemployed. The unemployed are very familiar with being unemployed on the street corner where they spend their time. So what the city of Wolverhampton, some unemployed men did in the city of Wolverhampton was to form themselves into small sets and they have created 300 businesses by pursuing action learning. Groups of five meeting and saying, what can we do? Why can't we do it? Who can help us? So there's one example. In the coal mines, what we did was to take real managers, give them familiar problems to look at in unfamiliar settings. We had the man from one mine going into the mine a mile or two away and discussing with the man on the spot what he thought the problem was. They all worked with each other. Now, they didn't do this because one man of the five was so good that he could tell all the others how to do it. They were all equal and they all listened to each other talking about their difficulties. So that was the National Coal Board. Here we have GEC. GEC is an enormous company with many vast numbers of uh, plant and the managers from one plant worked on the problems of somebody in another plant. They stayed in familiar conditions, they were all working for GEC, but they looked at totally unfamiliar problems. A man from, who was a production engineer looked at personnel problems and so forth. Down here, we had the famous Belgian program, what was called the Inter-University program, uh, the Inter-University program, P for program. This took top managers out of one company and put them full time for nine months in another company where they looked at problems with which they were totally unfamiliar. So that the chief logistics analyst of the SO Petroleum Company 
went into a bank to study a very complex policy problem of the bank that the bank themselves could not see the fullest light in. What we had was a man totally unfamiliar with the problem. Now, you can very well imagine that if you do any of these, the people who are put somewhere in here are forced to ask themselves quite fresh questions. That's how we develop Q. So Q is a product of this type of setting. Force people into any one of these four boxes and then get them to join the set when they discuss their progress and their obstructions with other people. We may be in the same box or a different box. Reg, what are the major benefits for companies that use this method of working and training? Well, I feel the right person to ask these questions are, who are the chief executives of the companies who are, who are doing it and continuing to do it. And uh, a man who's not unknown to many British industrialists, of course, will be Lord Weinstock, who saw me on a television program many years ago and who has been using action learning ever since. And I have the permission of the uh, managing director of one of his most successful companies, namely Ruston Gas Turbines, to say that had they not been into action learning for a year or two, it might not have been that they would have won the world contract, or the contract gained in the face of world competition, to build the necessary gas turbines and compressors for the Siberian pipeline. In general, there are three types of benefit. Firstly, the management get new insight into how to ask the questions relevant to overcoming their here and now problems. Secondly, the here and now problems, if not exactly overcome, are uh, ameliorated and great benefits come from that. But thirdly, there is a change of perception among all those concerned with development in the enterprise that it is the here and now difficulties that people have to solve, whether they do it by action learning or any other way, the recognition that it is from your here and now problems that you really learn. You will learn a little, of course, by listening to an expert on economic theory or sociology. But the real needs of a big company are that they should get their own managers trying to understand their own problems by trying to solve those problems. So those are, those are the real benefits. Finally then, Reg, would you sum up for us the importance of action learning for industry today? The principal benefit of action learning is that it will equip everybody in industry to anticipate more clearly the problems of tomorrow. We are, it is a question-posing approach, is action learning. But I would not like to feel that the work that's been done so far, and I myself have been into it for 40 years, is sufficient. We must bring into the same field the types of research, high-level intellectual analysis which characterizes postgraduate university studies in this country. Mm -hmm.